For today's episode of Guest Practices, I welcome two gig experts, Nicholas Schroeder, founder and CEO of Pro Collective, and Dr. Rochelle Haynes, lecturer, gig economist, and CEO of Crowd Potential. The growth of the gig economy has been creeping up on some organizations, with many now realizing the potential of a truly blended workforce. This is accelerating post-COVID as companies downsize, discover new operating models, and leverage contingent workers for the long term, not just for the short term and by project. How they formalize this, support it with enabling technologies and manage it will be key questions for 2021. My guests help get into this in a little bit deeper, Nicholas from the technology standpoint with his Pro Collective platform and how it binds everybody together in terms of communication, collaboration and expertise, and Dr. Rochelle Haynes in the evolution of the gig economy and what is happening with all of these moving parts coming together. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Guest Practices and this week you get two not one guests. We have Nicholas and Rochelle. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Be here. And Rochelle, you're an old hat at this. We've we've had you before, but we're coming back to this topic around the gig economy and you have been living and breathing this. Uh, You're a digital nomad, a gig expert. Tell us what you've been up to since the last time. Yeah, it's been interesting times. Um, I'm back here working remotely just for a few months and I've still been consulting, still been speaking a lot with regards to the gig economy and remote work. And I'm teaming up here with a group of consultants and other um, institutions on how to better facilitate remote work and build infrastructure around persons working in a gig way. So yeah, busy times. <laughs> it is busy times. I know what you've been up to. You've got to you've got lots going on in lots of different ways. And uh, we welcome you, Nicholas, as well, who's coming to us from Denmark. You're a gig entrepreneur. You're the co-founder of a platform called Co- uh, Pro Collective. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit more time because we've met Rochelle before. So to tell us a little bit about you, your business and platform, and how it supports businesses and the gig workforce. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, Yeah, my name is Nicholas Schroeder, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of a platform called Pro Collective, based here in Copenhagen. And uh, we built a platform that enables uh, businesses to manage and grow their blended workforce. And we help reduce the administrative burden they they experience and help them uh, scale on demand. So we, uh, we help them reduce the, the burden with regards to sourcing uh, uh, freelancers, onboarding, facilitating collaboration, and getting insights into the activity they the activities they do with uh, with those freelancers. So, uh, the, and it all started from from a report I read actually a year ago from Deloitte, uh, where I found that only eight percent of companies have the effective pro- uh, effective processes to manage. An alternative workforce, and this uh, this surprised me considering the, the freelance boom and the fact that companies are opening their doors a lot more to uh, to freelancers. So this was kind of the the inception of Pro Collective and how it came to be over the last last year. And uh, we plan to to launch the platform uh, in January. So we are full steam ahead, collaborating with some early adopters and and getting ready. Brilliant. Wow, it it is it is brilliant, isn't it? And and in fact, we've done a bit of research on this too. But I have to come back to the point that what you said there, Nicholas, eight percent really effectively managing this either as a process or through systems. I think one of the mistakes that we found is that many traditional organisations are still looking at it as something like managed services, where actually it's a whole new framework that we're talking about. Would you agree with that, Rochelle? Definitely. I've spoken to a lot of businesses that are not even considering the fact that their workforce is evolving to um, include a more dynamic range of of workers, not just employees, that full-time nine-to-five. So a lot of companies are struggling with how to include those workers, especially in the daily processes, 
how do you reward and train them in a way that would be effective and valued by them because it can't be in the same way that you do your full-time workers so it's really appreciating what are the needs of the different workers that you now have that are working together and i really like the name of um nicholas's business pro collective because it does remind me of um that that dynamic collective of uh, workers that you now have to cater for that's right. And the pro collective solution and platform is is something that we'll come into because we we also when we were doing some research around this, we yeah. felt that there was nothing really out there yeah. for the mix of both the independent workforce and organizations. And in fact, it's a very pertinent issue right now because our own research, Rochelle, which yeah. was the rise of the blended workforce, this kind of mix, which is which is hitting organizations everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. suggests that gig workers and independent workforce will make up 50% of any organization's workforce globally yeah. by the end of 2022. And in fact, it was a little bit, it was a little bit more like 2024, 25 until COVID hit and all of yeah. this has been accelerated. So yeah. it is, tra it is challenging traditional business structures and HR yeah. models. Yeah. And perhaps I'll come back to um, Nicholas on this one, because this is at the heart of the pro collective platform as well. And yeah. I'd like to ask you, as you were developing this, you know, what do you see are the main opportunities and risks when we consider this increasing mix of permanent independent workers for organizations everywhere? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the, the opportunities are plentiful when it comes to the organization's perspective. I mean, they have such a plethora of uh, opportunities to tap into such diverse labor. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the benefits from these opportunities can, can be the cost savings. So instead of hiring a full-time employee, they can uh, opt to source a, a freelancer. Um, and over time, they can determine whether that uh, that skill is needed on a full-time basis. So there's a lot of cost-saving opportunities there. Um, and generally, a blended workforce helps companies be a lot more agile and enables them to scale on demand. So if a big project comes in where they don't have a certain skill set or enough resources internally, they can uh, source uh, and create a team on demand to, uh, to meet those goals. And I think lastly, the a big opportunity is just to add some diversity to uh, a company's um, uh, workforce. I think the injection of, of new knowledge from external workers and even a bit of comp competition between full-time and uh, freelancers is, uh, can, help, uh, can help lift uh, a company's competitiveness. And with regards to risks, I think there's still quite a negative or there, there's some negative perception of uh, working with external workers, um, but I think that will dissipate over time as it becomes more mainstream. And a more understandable risk that companies uh, face would be around um, security, privacy, and uh, confidential information. But I think once a company establishes the processes and uh, gets uh, gets technology involved to streamline those processes with regards to signing NDAs and contracts, then uh, companies would be much more willing to uh, to work with freelancers and have that peace of mind. Yeah, some good stuff there, particularly from the organizational point of view. And, and you raised the point around crowdsourcing and these groups of people anywhere that is not now within 30 kilometers of your of your office or your head office, but is planet wide resources that we can pull on, which I kind of love the concept behind. But it does throw up, as you said, Nicholas, the some inclusion issues. Uh, we've had diversity and inclusion conversations in 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 our traditional businesses anyway. Now we're throwing in this whole independent workforce into the mix and we have to start using words like tolerance and belonging and understanding how we reframe that. But Coming back to this point about opportunities and risks, you really talk very eloquently about what organizations are facing here, but Rochelle, maybe you can bring in the, the gig worker perspective on this. What are the main opportunities and risks that, uh, that they're facing as this is now potentially going to formalize rather than become, or rather than be more informal, if you like, as it has been? Yeah, it just really reminds me of the um, the reason for the research in, in the first place. I remember uh, when we started that project that 
Um, it, it just seems to be a whole that all of these things around even diversity and inclusion were being directed at the full-time employee and their experiences. And there is this whole other invisible workforce that were being used but ignored or treated very casually. So I remember when we did the study, one of the things that kept coming up among gig workers was their experiences of discrimination. And I was surprised because several times I did the interviews and I really wanted to know about your work experience, the relationships, the contracts, those sort of things. But constantly, more, several gig workers, particularly women, kept saying, well, I, I had this experience. I had to leave the job. I was fired for this reason. I was referred to in this way. Um, one lady, she is a Jamaican lady, and she was used to working in um, Jamaican firms, international firms in Jamaica. And she said when she was in those firms, she was quite, she was very sure that she was being judged and appraised and referred to because of the quality of her work. She said as soon as she became a gig worker, she felt as she was being judged as a woman and she was being judged based on the color of her skin. And I wasn't looking for those sort of stories, but they kept coming up over and over the more nomads I spoke to. So then I started looking at it as, well, how can we actually, um, in the framework, one of the things we addressed was how do you actually create a sense of belonging and inclusion? And also those sort of procedures and regulations that protect persons in the gig space as well, because they also face these issues. It is very true. It's clear that we're formalizing the informal, but there is a big job to do, not just on the organizational side, but actually for gig workers themselves, and particularly yeah. some of those that we've both interviewed around this, uh, very, very passionate about what they do, might yeah. not necessarily always have had the experience in business to give them those skills about how do you negotiate a contract? How do you manage stakeholders? How do you do all of these kind of things? So there are, there are some risks here, but there are opportunities. Maybe we'll bring that round to that because we want to make this, this what has been called the invisible workforce. We want to make it very visible and a real part of the family within uh, organizations. Yeah. So as we look at this more positively and we enter 2021, and I'll, I'll come back straight back to you on this, Rochelle, first. What are the big messages for organizations and gig workers everywhere in how to more rapidly unlock the growth the, and the potential of greater collaboration through closer relationships, uh, mutual value adding projects that they're working on together and a longer term focus? I would say the first thing, and this is from my recent months of um, consulting, the constant um, vibe I get from a lot of organizations is, okay, this is temporary. We're going back to our way of working soon. I think the main message I would say to organizations is forget to normal, stop waiting to go back to normal. There's no normal to go back to. You know, this is your new reality. And it's very important that you now have that open and adaptable mindset to be able to fit into that and to accommodate um, this new reality, these new set of workers and working in a more dynamic and flexible way and also with a wider uh, category of people. So I think that's one of the main things that I would say to organizations in this context. Uh, <clears throat> with regards to gig workers, I would say Sorry, not with regards to gig workers, but with regards to managing gig workers, I would say organizations should also take a look on a complete review of the procedures and policies and practices that they have in place and see if they're actually inclusive and suitable to all workers. And I think we need to rethink diversity in that case as well. When we think of diversity, we think of um, protected characteristics, race, gender, age, sex, those sort of things. But no, in terms of um, the type of workers and people that make up a team, we now also have to think of online, offline, and how we treat those people. So it's, it's very important when you look at your policies to see if actually they're capable of protecting everyone that you are included in your workforce. Yeah, and it is about, as you said right at the beginning, it's going forward, not backwards. It's looking at those possibilities and new ways of working. And many organizations have proved that they can do it. Let's just look at 2020 yeah. and how organizations have had to reorientate themselves to virtual working. People have sort of stepped over that big chasm that they've seen that has been a, almost that they've been resisting to do so. And they've suddenly found that there are more possibilities rather than roadblocks. And this is the same with this here. We're moving into a 
brave new world but like like this year this what you've been describing starts with mindset and it does come with reimagining processes systems people management frameworks and so on and coming back to nicholas on this point um there are undoubtedly opportunities to unlock this what might you have to add to what rochelle has said around what should be our key messages to organizations and gig workers for 2021 well i think rochelle covered it pretty well um i think there does need to be a rethinking in how employ in how organizations think about the employer to worker relationship um even just looking at employees uh, today can they consist a lot of millennials and most of those millennials want to start their own business, like me, for example, or um, they want to they want to have their work to uh, re reflect their personal interests. Um, and so, even even the employees that companies have right now, they might not be um, satisfying their their workers' needs, let alone the uh, independent workers or the ex external workers. So, I think. Not to put it all on HR, but I think HR has a big opportunity rather to take advantage um, and, and to lead the way in how organizations view the employer to work a relationship. And I don't think technology is definitely not a silver bullet when it comes to these things. It, it definitely requires um, new, uh, new internal processes and, and mindsets of management. Um, and I think, I think you, Jeremy will will uh, will agree to that. <laughs> and uh, once that's in place, I think companies like uh, like Pro Collective can can fill in and uh, and help optimize uh, that that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I I definitely agree with that, Nicholas. I think this employer worker relationship is at the heart of it. Um, in you know, right now in many organizations, that employer worker relationship is about our permanent workforce and our organization. The, 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 the broadening of that view hasn't happened with many organizations yet to say our workforce can actually include contractors, independent workers, project workers, uh, remote workers, digital workers, traditional work, so many things that we call this blended workforce. And it is actually when when organizations do embrace it, it is it is unleashing that entrepreneurial spirit spirit, a, a more empowering culture, actually, which is, I think, what you're getting at. And I agree with you. HR, human capital management really have to lead, lead it, uh, lead that. But I have to say, I come back to and I'm going to pick up again with you, Nicholas, on this one, because. Mm -hmm. When Rochelle and I were doing this research, as I mentioned before, there's very little out there that provides that sort of platform, that solid platform in terms of system and process to bring and glue together all of these different facets together, you know, in terms of collaboration, management, sourcing, uh, connections between the independent workers that, that become your resource, et cetera, and more. So how will technologies like Pro Collective which is really hot off the press, be part of that solution moving forward. Yeah, I think you can see right now, especially since COVID, um, collaboration software has completely boomed and uh, Microsoft Teams and Google Hangouts and Zoom, that's extremely popular, but, and will continue to be popular. But I think what we at Pro Collective have done well and that others might not be able to support that well is, is supporting the complex relationships involved in a blended workforce. So whether that be an employee to a manager, an employee to a freelancer, or even an employee to a, a student freelancer, uh, or freelancer to a freelancer, all these complex relationships need to be uh, understood and supported. And that's what Pro Collective does very well. So in, in our platform, based on the types of relationships you, uh, you have and who you are, you will view things differently. Um, and so let's take a, a CEO of a company on Pro Collective would be able to see all the administrative features of reporting and, uh, and all the, be able to create projects, but an employee would just be able to focus on the work. Um, and the freelancer, a part of that company's blended workforce would also just be able to see part of the work if there are some privacy settings. So. Yeah, just to, to sum up, I think that one thing that Pro Collective does well is really support these complex relationships. 
and it it goes right just down to the the very simple facts of i'm collaborating with either a manager or with another person i might be collaborating with another freelancer but where do we put all of this together? Traditional managed services doesn't really do it. The structures that we've got together in our traditional organizations don't really do it. So this is something that really helps because the different hierarchies that you've created in it and, and having a look a little bit closer, having the benefit of seeing it a little bit closer now with you, Nicholas, is just the kind of place where everything can be under an umbrella. And that's what we found, isn't it, Rochelle, that uh, we needed something there that needs to manage the, these kind of things, because you've, got, you've just got to unleash this spirit of collaboration, empowered working, and yeah. just focus on the task and the relationships at hand. Yeah, and we found a really good response as well to the gig HR firm framework, just because of that need that is out there. And um, in doing a lot of research and a lot of workshops around the gig HR framework recently, one of the things that I'm constantly um, trying to like trying to push is again going back to the mindset. What you mentioned about um, those out processing services and um, those outsourcing processes and services. One of the things that I've been keen to to hammer home to companies is to stop thinking of gig workers as an add-on and think of them more as a member of the team. And I think that conversion hasn't quite happened yet in um, a lot of the minds of managers and leaders in organizations. Gig workers are still seen as, let's say, for the logistics team to handle, for this, pro, um, this external service to handle, rather than actually being seen as members and parts of the organization. So just that reorientation in thinking, I think, is really needed. And I think that's where the, the, the research helps and the framework helps, the framework helps. It certainly does. And in fact, I'll come back to Nicholas on that point, because um, I know you sort of headlined it for us. But if I look at what Rochelle's saying there, on a higher level, your mission is to provide essential tools and technology for managing and collaborating this blended workforce. Once we've got past this, these old sort of lenses of looking at it, that's a gig worker, that's a permanent employee, that's something else, that's something else. This is our workforce. So what are those things that um, that that you do that help at that higher level to bring all of this together within Pro Collective, Nicholas? Yeah, first note to, to uh, carry on with, with what Rochelle was saying, I think it's really important, and we at Pro Collective often say that we want companies to work with freelancers uh, strategically instead of transactionally. And that's that's a big difference that we at ProCollective uh, want to support. Um, with regards to what, what ProCollective does is we, we first allow or enable companies to manage their existing network, but there's definitely a, a big other side of our platform, which is, which is that we support the, the freelancers uh, journey as well. So we provide freelancers with a professional network with people they actually work with. Um, and to have this other side of the platform is really imperative for us because companies want those freelancers to be engaged and we want those freelancers to want to work on, on that platform. So it's a, it's, it's a two-sided solution that we have. Um, and if one, if one doesn't work, then neither of them work. So it's a, it's a tricky one to, uh, to nail down, but I think the time is right for both companies and freelancers to, to meet in the middle. And uh, I really hope and I believe that Pro Collective can, can do that. Yeah, well, I, I, Rochelle and I, having done research into this and seeing that gap in the market, I, there's a few things that we love around that. That's that sort of peer-to-peer -peer experience that's connecting these different professionals in there, giving them a professional identity that, you know, organizations and them so, and they can trust. You know, it's not just the organizations to the independent workers, it's independent workers and the organizations that they're dealing with, you know, particularly if they want a valuable long-term relationship. So there's lots here that does it. And of course, we would both agree that it's that digital thread that really, really makes it, you know, that binds everything together. So maybe if I come back to you, Rochelle, and say what you might recommend as the top two to three actions that any organization can take now to fast track progress in sort of modernizing this approach to the workforce and releasing the potential of both 
the permanent employees that they've got, but this increasing talented gig independent workforce, which, which in essence could double their success. Yeah, I think why I always recommend to organizations is to, and it sounds very processual, I guess, um, but I always recommend that organizations start with a sort of internal audit of their, their regulations and their processes to see how, how relevant they actually are and how they can be applied. Also looking at their, even their recruitment, how are you recruiting workers? What sources are you going to for recruitment and how inclusive are those sources? And also look at your current makeup of workers as well. Um, are they all full-time employees? Where are those full-time employees coming from? And if you do want to start being more inclusive of, inclusive of, gig, work, inclusive of gig workers, sorry, start to think of um, where you're actually sourcing those workers for, from. So I think before they can really start on trying to build that relationship with gig workers, I think they need to take an internal audit of understanding what's been stopping them from engaging with um, a wider set of workers in the first place. Yeah, that's that's a great piece of work that they can do is looking at where are we now and why haven't we done this yeah. in the past? And are we ready, in fact, you know, what needs to be in place yeah. from a process systems, but all, also climate and culture perspective, because yeah. it sort of changes everything. Maybe, Nicholas, I'll ask you the, the same question. What would you recommend as sort of two to three key actions that would fast track this? Yeah, well, assuming that the organization has done the internal audit as Rochelle has recommended, and they do work with um, with external workers, I would suggest, I would put a lot of onus on the on the HR team. And I would, I would suggest that they get more involved in the sourcing and the onboarding of the external workers. Um, and additionally, that they perhaps provide some training for these external workers so they get up to speed on how that organization works um, and what their strategy is so they can be aligned and work better uh, together in the future. Um, I think it, it's, there's no real fast track to this kind of stuff, but if once you do, once you front load the, the effort, then I think after that, then it's, then you really see the benefits of a blended workforce and you can, uh, you can conquer the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I That's agree. Yeah. The, I agree. Anything well, to add, Michelle, Rochelle? Oh, sorry. No, I was agreeing with a lot of what um, Nicholas has said, and a big part of that and achieving that is is trust, really, because in in training workers and um, being more inclusive and making sure they understand the processes, a lot of companies have to be willing to share information with them. Um, and if you're constantly looking at workers as those workers as still being external to the organization, then that barrier to sharing information comes up. So I think, yeah, I, I agree with what Nicholas has said, and we really need to start working, uh, like breaking down those mental barriers in the way that we think about gig workers. Yeah, and it does it does raise, of course, uh, the sort of bigger macro issues. We're in the era where, um, you know, cybercrime, uh, data manipulation could cost industry by the end of next year something close to six trillion dollars. So when you're now saying, right, we've got to bring all of this together, we've got external, internal, you know, how do we do it? Then actually having a system and a platform that does that in a secure way, that provides that evidence trail, uh, protects data and so on, is something that doesn't really exist because uh, as Nicholas and both of you said, actually, is that we've not really thought about this in organizations before, not thought of it beyond managed services and the new way forward and, and going forward. And, and it is the opportunity within HR 3.0 or 4.0, whatever terminology you prefer <laughs> right now, to actually stand up and lead this in the boardroom to help the executive understand that this is coming whether we like it or not as a trend, because the talent within the workforce is not just about the permanent employees anymore. But you know, that's what we're talking about from an organizational point of view. So perhaps I come back to Nicholas first on this. So in the same way, what are the two to three actions that we might recommend for independent gig workers so that they can be a proactive part of this process? A very good question. I think gig workers have a lot on their plate as it is now, I mean, they they not only have to do their their job very well, but they're their own advertising, um, they're on their, their own HR. They do so much already. So I think 
one thing that I can think of that would help organizations kind of open their arms and embrace the blended workforce revolution, as you say, um, is to really focus on team uh, teamwork and collaborating and going the extra mile with the internal teams of that organizations so that that they that you kind of force them to see that you're not just a transaction that you are you can bring creativity you can uh, just go the extra mile in terms of, of teamwork um it's a bit of a bit of a fluffy recommendation but i think i think it uh, would do the trick <laughs> well it's part of the formalizing the informal and it's professionalizing the approach for some gig workers uh, because it has uh, Rochelle you're right when you say it has been in some ways it's been a little bit casual sometimes it's no accident actually that in a, the research that we found that it was Gen Xers who are making the biggest move to this as they look in their own organizations and think I don't want that I think I can do this myself here and that comes with professionalism and potentially that's that's competitive advantage when they consider a predominantly millennial gig workers that may not have had that experience. So all gig workers need to upskill themselves in this. And it's a very key message for them, that I would say. So potentially an unfair question for you both. But I want to ask you, what what is the prize if if organizations and gig workers get this right? So maybe if I come to you first, Rochelle, on this one, is that what, what you know, what are the benefits that can be realized from from both sides of this, from the organizational point of view and from the gig work point of view? I think we need a whole other episode <laughs> <laughs> for the amount of benefits that organizations can gain. I mean, down to better work and relationships, I say that that would be the number one one um, benefit for me. Um, just that reduced conflict and better understanding of what your organizational team um, needs and what the company is aiming towards. Also, in terms of being more competitive, you now are able to recruit from anywhere across the globe. There are no limits and COVID has really accelerated and shown that. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the benefits, you have enhanced collaboration, you have a wider pool of talent and not just any talent, but the best and the expert, most expert talent to choose from. Um, increased satisfaction among your workers as well when you're giving more flexibility for employees to work in the way that they want to work. Um, being able to execute more projects at a time and also that wider learning as well for the company you're able now to learn uh, about markets. Um, I remember before if companies wanted to learn let's say if they wanted to break into the Asian market they might send some expatriates abroad and try to learn about the, the context and then have them transfer that knowledge and now you have a team that's become a lot more diverse and persons that are based within those markets but working with you virtually um, who, gives you, who gives you on hand knowledge and, and up to date and recent knowledge without the company having to invest all of the, that resourcing. Not to say that expatriate assignments still aren't relevant. Um, they probably slowed down during that time. They're extremely important, uh, but you do have those sort of benefits as well from using gig in workers and independent contractors. And just more satisfaction and, and motivation for both parties. Uh, in fact, the point that resonates for me is the learning journey is that organizations leaders the traditional mindset can really reset it's unlearning what we used to do relearning and finding new ways and new opportunities through doing it this way and it may uncover new solutions and new ways yeah. of going to market who knows nicholas yeah. what about you what would what would you say what uh, what are some of the benefits that uh, you'd add to this that's tough it's tough to add she uh, <laughs> rochelle covered covered most of it but i, I think maybe to sum up uh, what she said and I think for the organizational perspective, they, if they get this right, they will win uh, the, the war for talent. And um, if they can make, uh, if they can make an organi their organization attractive for, for gig, uh, gig workers to, to want to work at, then they're, they're set and they, they will have a competitive advantage over their, uh, their, their competition. Um, and the gig workers who are part of this uh, blended workforce revolution, they will have a lot more stability in their work um, and they'll have the they'll have more chances to grow and to upskill and develop themselves if they work more closely with their with their, their client organizations so yeah yeah the war for talent that takes me back to the first one uh, now we're now we're coming into I don't know where we're at now the third I can't remember but it's a really good point actually and it does challenge 
not just what we're talking about here, but the supporting industries like the recruitment industry and what attracting, rewarding, recognizing and um, retaining talent looks like when you've got a blended workforce. That that is another video cast Rochelle so we won't go down that road right now so thank you both so much for joining us uh we've we've covered quite a lot in a relatively short period of time but I'm sure that those viewers and listeners will may want to find out more so Nicholas how do they find out more about uh Pro Collective and how can they get in touch with you the easiest way would just uh, to go to our website at procollective.io and there's a contact form and also my uh, phone number on the about page. So feel free to reach out whenever. That's very brave of you putting your phone number on your website like that. Good one. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Um, and Rochelle, what about you? How do, how do people connect with you? Um, they can check out our company website, which is Crowd Potential, www.crowdpotential.co.uk. And for more information, if they wanted to speak to us, they can email us at contact at crowdpotential.co.uk or on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Thank you very much. So, Nicholas, Rochelle, thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining our guest practices video cast. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel through the link below or check out our website to access more in our current series of expert interviews.